welcome back to the session the second session of the morning i hope you've um grabbed a cup of tea or coffee which i, I have managed to do um we've got a few questions outstanding that we we didn't we didn't um answer before particularly um simon's answer a, a question about um making people redundant we will we will try and pick that up through the morning and we'll get some responses back to you and also tina asked um, a very interesting question around not everybody wants to um share where they live um and it's it, you know there's that feel of, of embarrassment and um I think it's okay when we were talking as a panel for people not to have the camera on and you know it's, it's all that sort of work around being flexible and bending so again we will get through those um, questions i'm going to move us on now and i'm going to welcome you all back and we've got a master class uh, with julia alba metcalf ceo from real world group so i'm going to hand um hand the session over to juliet in a minute but first i have also got to remind you that there are still places on our workshops this afternoon um make managing conflict for well-being when home isn't a safe place taking an organizational approach to domestic abuse and violence and i think domestic abuse and um, in the work you know talking about that in the workplace has often been really really taboo and i think it's really timely with all the stuff that is happening nationally um around particularly around women and I, we, we know that um violence isn't just um women so um just really think about um looking at some of the zoom workshops this afternoon if you've got time to do that so now i'm going to hand you over to juliet thank you catherine um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to be sharing some of our, our, our thoughts and our research around how leaders enhance well-being. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to basically talk particularly about what kind of leadership we need as we move, continue to move through COVID and then beyond. What kind of leaders, how, how do leaders need to shape their leadership to, to, to rise to, you know, what we're calling the new work order? and for organizations to thrive in that context. I'm gonna give you the opportunity to reflect on your own leadership as part of this. So we might have a couple of opportunities. Well, certainly I'll ask lots of questions, I'll ask you, offer you, to, offer you the opportunity to ask questions, but we'll also um, sort of have some pauses for self-reflection. And then I'll be leaving you um, with some final thoughts as well. Please do put your sort of comments and reflections and and questions in the chat box. And my colleagues here will be um, helping me to sort of see them as we go through. So I'm a chartered occupational psychologist, so that's the perspective that I come from. Um, I run a company called Real World Group. We are a, a we're Leeds based, which I'm very proud about. We actually are a spin out of Leeds University. And we've been around for 20 years. What we do is we do research into what creates high performance in organizations, but, but critically, how do you create high performing teams and organizations that not only out, you know, outperform your, whatever sector average you're in, but, but maintain and in, enhance actually the well being of the people within the organization? Because there's no point in having high performance if it's not sustainable because people are burnt out and exhausted. And, and as, um, Colleagues on the panel just now were talking about aren't able to bring their whole selves to work. So that's what I'm going to be sharing with you, some of our reflections and, and thoughts um, about that. Um, and uh, yeah, so without further ado, I shall crack on and start sharing my slides. So I have to, we've worked out, I need to share my full desktop in order to be able to share the slides. So forgive this, um, this, uh, it's not quite as smooth as it might be. Here we go. Right. So I called the presentation Leading Through COVID and Beyond, Who Cares Wins? Because effective leadership really is about, at its core, genuine concern for the people with whom we work. If we don't show genuine concern towards them, we can't get the best out of them. So, you know, apart from the moral case and the human case for treating people well and, and caring about their aspirations and so on, the bottom line business case is that if we as leaders don't operate with humanity, then, you know, we lose out. And so does the bottom line. 
So let's start talking about the context to begin with. What's the context and how have people been experiencing working through COVID-19? Now, I did catch the end of the last panel session. If you were there, forgive me if I'm repeating anything that was talked about before. So here's some research. Some research by Randstad Reinsmart of, of a, a thousand people found that 54% of people who responded to the survey said that they're at a point now due to the stress and pressure of the ways they're having to work and the huge turbulence has occurred over the last 12 months, that they feel like they're just going through the motions at work. They're not able to, to give their full capacity at all because of how, what, how, how things are. Nuffield Health have done lots of research as well around mental health at work and they found that 80% of people in their survey reported they, they feel a significant decline in their mental health in working from home during the pandemic. Westfield Health has also done some interesting research in this area and they found that 56% of people who are on furlough, the anxiety that that's creating means that they're experiencing a decline in their mental health. I think, you know, especially during the last warm summer we had, there was a tendency perhaps for those of us at work to think, oh gosh, I wish I was on furlough, you know, sitting in the garden rather than working. But actually those people have been, you know, suggests that a lot of them have been really anxious too. And of course, it won't surprise you to know that um, way more than half of, of working parents on furlough have felt a decline in their mental health as well, because, you know, that the, it adds the particular um, challenges of childcare um, and educating children from home and all of those things. And then, you know, if we then think about people's experiences of working whilst taking care of children, that's a whole other area of, of, of challenge. So these, these issues relate to how the world has changed. But what we're interested in as well is what's going to happen next. Well, what this all suggests is that employers and, employ and, and leaders need to be much more concerned than they were before about well-being and people's mental health in and out of work. But what we need to be thinking about as well is, is that, that the world has changed forever. People, of course, will start to return from furlough or, or people organisations will have to make tough decisions about the size of their workforce and, and so on. But what we know is that even when people move back into work, you know, in a, you know when, when furlough ends, when you know, um, people who've been working from home move into more of a steady state, assuming we ever get a steady state again, the world has actually changed forever. And one of the main changes, of course, when it comes to, to the implications for leaders is that employees don't want to go back to how things were before. And there's lots of research around there um, uh, that sort of um, explains some of the, you know, some of the implications of that and, and, and how widespread this desire is. So, for example, there's the work after lockdown study, which you may be familiar with, which is a, um, a survey of just over a thousand people in the public and private sectors. And what they found is perhaps not surprisingly, in spite of all the challenges, 70% of people who responded to their survey said that they were in no rush to return to the workplace. They found that 90% of people feel overall that they're more productive at home than they are in the office. And that can also include, of course, the fact that they don't they no longer have the complications of the commute, which can be quite significant and obviously can be often quite stressful. And that at least 60% of people really enjoy the flexibility that working from home gives them. Now, if we add to that, the fact that, you know, every day in the newspapers, there's, there's more and more, or, or, you know, in the news in general, say newspapers, of course, I mean, I'm blind, I mean, I'm not all that old. Um, in the um, in in the uh, in the news every day, we hear about more and more organisations talking about they're not going to return to so-called business as usual. We talk about banks like HSBC talking about significantly having already reduced the size of their real estate. We talk about com companies like Twitter, you know, the, obviously the the the, the, the companies that, that traditionally are at the forefront of new working practices, proven or unproven, that are talking about well, working from home, but 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 now. What we're seeing is that, you know, um, according to research from Robert Half, which is um, an executive search firm, about 89% of uh, organisations that they interviewed are not going to be returning to business as usual in terms of they're going to have much more flexible working than there was before. 
Now, of course, what we know about creating more of a, a virtual workplace or a hybrid workplace where you might have teams in for some days a week and some days working virtual, or you might have some teams that are fully virtual, you know, all kinds of different combinations. But we know that when we allow people to have that choice of working from home, that both the employers and the employees benefit from it. Because if people are working in ways that suit them better, they're likely to be more engaged in the with, with their work and the organization because you know it's more it's more motivating and pleasurable rather than going against the grain in terms of the ways they want to work and gives them more flexibility and, and in some ways more work-life balance. But it also of course benefits the organization not just in terms of employee engagement, but also of course in the lower overheads that naturally come with reducing real estate. So it is a win-win and you can see why businesses are embracing it and why people are keen to continue working this way. On the whole, of course, what we know is that for many people work, uh, as, as Catherine was talking about at the end of the last session, um, for many people, home isn't a safe place or home will never be conducive to working working there. But for those people, for the vast majority of people, what research is suggesting is that people would rather have some kind of hybrid. So what that means for leadership, of course, is that as leaders, we need to adapt. We seriously need to rethink how we lead so that we're just as effective, or perhaps that's be even more effective, leading hybrid teams or virtual teams rather than, you know, the traditional way of working with teams being um, typically face to face. Although let's also not forget that, you know, remote teams and virtual teams isn't a new phenomenon. You can trace it back to at least the 1970s when there was an oil crisis and when people, when organizations were encouraging people not to waste petroleum, as they say in America, on coming to work. And actually, you know, that, that's when the rise of homeworking started. Although, of course, it's, you know, it, it's a, in, it, obviously over the last year, it's, it suddenly exploded. But we've also had, you know, teams like nursing teams, oil workers, you know, salespeople, people have been remote for a long time. So you know, let, let's not forget this isn't a brand new phenomenon. But what we know when we look at how leaders are adapting at the moment to the new work order as we're calling it is that there are definitely some challenges and there's definitely some room for us to need to develop leaders to be more fit for the new work order um, within organizations so some research by sharon parker and colleagues this is a global study of 1400 people what they found and this was this is just um, last year 60 percent of leaders either agree or they're not sure so they're not disagreeing that people work less well outside the office. So more than half of leaders that they surveyed across a range of countries and, and sectors uh, felt that people actually, they didn't trust that people would work as well, or they might work less well outside the office. And what's also interesting about this research is when they analyzed the research by age group, it wasn't that, you know, older leaders as you know who we typically use as stereotypes as stuck in their ways and so on that were the ones who who weren't keen it wasn't about them not being keen to adapt actually younger managers were even less you know were, were even less likely to feel that people work well outside the office now what that means of course is when people aren't trusted outside the office and when people don't feel able to lead people outside of a face-to-face -face envi environment what's happening is we're seeing that a lot of weaker leadership and i call it leadership in inverted commas because actually it's 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 management that's dressed up as leadership often it isn't true leadership is 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 what's being exposed there has forever been a challenge of effective leadership in organizations much more management than leadership in, in so many organizations unfortunately and this is really coming to the fore now and it's also what this research has shown as well and and what you know you, you might expect from how things have how things have been in, in in leadership research is that it comes down to a lack of confidence often on a manager's part that's the root cause of them not believing people can work outside the office because they don't know how they don't feel confident to do that we can't often blame them for not being good leaders because no one ever really taught them how. They might just be a good manager and we need to help them with leadership skills. So what this research found was that at least 40% of leaders admitted, I just don't have the confidence to lead people well outside the office environment. And what's happening then, if a leader doesn't trust their people, 
is that they are then moving on to um, uh, they're in, in enhancing micromanagement that might have already been there before, but it's even worse than it was before. There's an increase in lack of trust, and it's leading to dysfunctional behaviours. So what we mean by that, of course, is that you know you, you hear some some you hear people on a day to day basis saying, I, I, you know, how can I trust people if I can't see them? Because they, as leaders, were never equipped to do that, never learn how to do that. We're also learning things like um, you know, well, um, people talk about the surveillance software that's being increased and you know quite rightly criticized because that's no way to run an organization to surveil people that's just an extreme of micromanagement and we've also got organizations that are saying things like you know you need to be in your laptop in front of your laptop between nine and six you better have your camera on because we're going to check so it's leading to all kinds of dysfunctional behavior at an organization level and at a technology level now what happens of course when we don't trust people when we demonstrate that through how we micromanage them is it puts more pressure on them, increases their stress, increases their anxiety, and it declines their mental health. It increases their distraction, so they're not able to focus on work, and it, as a result, it reduces their performance. So guess what happens? It reinforces that we can't trust them to work outside the office. But what's happening here, as you can see, is a lot of this could be addressed if leaders thought again about how they lead. And leadership, as you probably you know, know just from your personal experience of working with leaders, or I should say managers, individuals in management and leadership roles can be the biggest source of stress in the workplace. So we've got to start by looking at leadership if we want to enhance well-being through COVID and beyond. So if we think then, if we move on to, okay, so, so you know, what needs to change specifically? Let's get down to some of the nuts and bolts. One of the things to be thinking about as a leader is being more conscious than usual of what not to do and what to do. So we'll start with the what not to do, and then we'll spend the rest of the session today talking about um, more of the what to do stuff. So this is... This is what I'm going to talk to you about is, is, is based on research that has been around for a long time, but actually it's really emphasised by the current situation. What not to do? Micromanagement. If you want to think of ways to destroy people's sense of meaning in their work, to make them feel like they can't really get stuff done, then micromanage them, because that's, that's a, just a brilliant way of re reducing people's motivation and over time their commitment. So we really need to get a grip on this. We need to understand, do people feel we're micromanaging, even if, even if we don't think we are, and what do we need to let go of? Dismissing ideas or being cynical is another great way of increasing people's pressure, their stress, and reducing their commitment and motivation. And that means when they make suggestions, you know, whether it's in a team context or in a one-to-one -one context, that you're like, well, nice idea, but it'll never work or saying, well, uh, you know, I'm not sure that's a great idea. Any ways in which we don't, it's not about, leadership isn't about taking on everybody's suggestions, of course it's not. But lead, good leaders, leaders are open to ideas and they at least present it a neutral front, they, they, they will consider ideas before they explain why, you know, what might need to change for it to be good as an idea, an effective idea, or, or why it won't necessarily work. But dismissing ideas out of hat is a very common way that leaders destroy people with meaning and satisfaction in their work. Neglecting to inform people when things change, this is a huge issue in organisations. That uh, Particularly, and it can often flow from the top of an organisation, the senior leaders don't, don't inform their direct reports when things have changed or are changing and therefore they don't uh, you know, inform the people that they manage and so on and so forth. But Imagine how demoralizing, and perhaps this is one of the experiences you've had, it can be when you're working on something and giving it, you know, a lot of effort and time and attention, and then you discover later on down the line, actually, things have changed. So moving the goalposts is related to this. And so it's about either when, you know, you don't keep people informed when things in the wider context have changed, or when you move the goalposts and, you know, you change some of the non-negotiables about what needs to happen. And you don't keep people, you know, you don't you don't keep them on, on track with you about what they need to achieve by when and how. So 
I'm going to move on now to what leaders should do. And there'll be opportunities to reflect on the what you should do and the extent to which you believe you engage in these things that we need to do that really, you know, enhance people's engagement, their productivity, their commitment, and so on and so forth. And I want to just say something about virtual teams. The important thing to understand about effective leadership as we move into virtual team working or hybrid team working is that actually virtual teams are not so different. I've just been doing a doctorate, I'm, I'm going through a doctorate at the moment, looking specifically at what leadership behaviors are successful in hybrid virtual teams. All of the research points to the same kind of behaviors that are, that are critical, but which are missing typically in teams and organizations are just what virtual teams need to. So, you know, it's kind of a win-win. If you can enhance these leaderships, because if you can make sure that you, you focus on these, that you enact them regularly, then it's a win-win across the board, whether you're leading face-to-face -face teams or whether you're leading virtual teams. Now, we've developed models of leadership over the last 20 years that uh, you know are sort of 14-factor models that really look down at the, the detail of day-to-day -day behaviors at an individual or team level or whatever. I'm not going to present those today, um, but I'm happy to share articles if you want to understand this in more detail. What I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about whether you follow our research or whether you follow uh, big thinkers like Simon Sinek or whether you follow Daniel Pink or Daniel Goldman or, you know, all of these these, these sort of big thinkers in, in the space of, of leadership or psychology or organization development, organization design or neuroscience, what you'll recognize are some of the key super factors that people talk about as being the most effective for creating positive outcomes for organizations and super factors in terms of groups of leadership behaviors. So let's start with, you know, as Stephen Covey would suggest, let's start with the end in mind. What do we need in teams, given that we live in, in such a, you know, ever-changing time and things aren't going to become stable anytime soon? The first thing, of course, we need is for our teams to be characterized by high levels of change readiness. Uh, in the end of the last presentation, or the last sort of panel, Group, people were talking about how do you reassure people when um, when when things are unstable, when things are unknown. And I think the suggestions that people made on the panel were, were absolutely right. Honesty, openness, keeping people informed, asking what they need to know, those kinds of things. And in addition, what you, what is critical is that through your leadership behaviour, you create the conditions where your where your teams have high readiness for change. So. There are, you know, you can describe the culture and the ways that teams work because of the ways that the leaders are encouraging them to operate that mean that certain teams are more resilient, they feel more self-confident, both individually and as a team, they're clear about expectations, but they have a culture of change readiness. So they're much more able than other teams to innovate and do things differently and, and roll with, you know, changes in, in the sector and the global context. Then, of course, you know, Alongside that, we need people to be constantly thinking about how we do things differently, not just in terms of, you know, the outputs that we create, but also how we get there. So how do we how we operate that we are able to to improve processes and systems as well as the outputs. We, of course, as I mentioned before, we need people to be resilient because, you know, change is speeding up and is not is not likely to, to slow down anytime soon. We need, of course, people to work to the maximum performance because resources are either lesser or at least no more than they ever were, yet demands are higher because of the complexity of the world and the environment. And of course, as I mentioned before, the whole reason I'm here is we need to, of course, ensure that our teams are characterized by high levels of well-being. So if we move on then to, as I mentioned, the super factors, and as I said, I think you'll recognize these regardless of, of, of which people you're, you, you follow. So the first one, of course, if we want to create teams that are characterized by high levels of change, readiness, innovation, so on and so forth, we need to ensure they have a strong sense of meaning in the work that they do. And I'm going to expand these in a moment in terms of what they mean. They need to have a strong sense of autonomy as individuals and as a team, a strong sense of mastery in the work that they do. They need to feel appreciated and valued. They need to have level, high levels of psychological safety within the team. And also they need to feel socially supported. So if we think about those that in a virtual team context, what we're talking about is, in terms of meaning, 
we need to make sure that our team members genuinely understand how does what they do contribute to the bigger vision of the department, the bigger vision of the organization, and in general to society. Even if you work in the private sector, people always want to know, you know, not, not, not all people, but most people want to have a sense of how does what I contribute actually make a difference in one way or another. Um, one thing that's also critical, I think Jodie mentioned earlier on the panel, was that people need to, in small ways and large ways, contribute to the vision of what they're working on and, on, you know, who they're, you know, what they're working with and what they're working towards. So it's critical that we involve people in building shared visions whenever we can. And of course, you know, that might include other stakeholders as well. And as I mentioned before, kept informed as things move and change. Then the next thing is about trusting people to do their job. Autonomy is really critical. You know, all of us have a desire to be able to control our environments and our world and to try to predict the future. And, as, and, and part of that, what enables that is, is having autonomy to the right level. So that means being trusted, which is one of the areas where leaders often, and what micromanagement is all about, where leaders often don't necessarily succeed, but they could. Then there's the issue of being given latitude in terms of decision making. And another thing that's often missing, again, from the board downwards, that leaders tend not to necessarily demonstrate positive expectations. They don't say to people, you're going to be great. I'm sure you're going to achieve this. You know, they don't, through their words and their deeds, demonstrate that they actually expect people to succeed. And as I said, that applies all the way at the top of organisations. And then you've got issue that is critical that you give people a sense of mastery, which means that you actually, when you when you expand their capability and, and you increase their, their, their sort of exposure or their opportunities to grow, that you coach and mentor them through that growth and through that expansion. And also what's critical around mastery is that you give people clarity of expectations. There is nothing worse than giving people new opportunities or stretch assignments or more visibility but not being clear about the non-negotiables. So as a leader, you need to be always thinking, have I been clear about what's expected and then where there is latitude for them to put their own, to shape it their own way or the way they think will be most effective. Appreciation of critics, it's critical, of course, you know, you can't put a price on what it means to people when you go around and thank them for what they've done, especially when things have been tough. But another part of appreciation as well, of course, is asking people's opinion so demonstrating that you value them because, you know, they matter. So if you're familiar with David Rock's work around neuroscience, he talks about status, and that's what this is. It's about making people realise that they do matter, that you've noticed, that you, you value them as an intelligent human being contributed to the organisation. And then there's the issue around psychological safety, of course. This is an increasingly popular topic, which is about ensuring that teams and individuals feel there's a climate in which they can contribute new ideas without fear of ridicule, that they will be respected within the team and that they, they feel that their sense of self is not going to be threatened by how the team operates. And then finally, social support. And of course, this might be the one of the ways that we need to work particularly hard as virtual leaders. Um, leaders of virtual teams, which is that we ensure that social support is still there, despite the fact that peers are much more disparate than before. So those are the key things, and I hope they've given you some suggestions about it. But my, my sort of conclusion on, on this point is that when it comes to face-to-face -to -face or hybrid or virtual teams, the leadership needs and the leadership required behaviours have not changed, it's just the context. Of course, there'll be things that need to, you know, that need to support virtual teams, like you know, a much increased focus on things like version control and um, ways of creating communication opportunities that would have happened face to face and so on. We haven't got time to talk about those today, but when it comes down to the sort of, you know, the, the foundations that will make all this stuff work, no matter how sophisticated your technology, it's going to be about your leadership behaviours as an individual or leading a team. And it's about, and I can't emphasise enough, it's about behaviour. It's not about personality type. A personality can be really useful to understand how we operate as teams. It can be really useful for selection, making sure people are fit for the right job or are a good fit. And it can be useful for leaders to understand themselves better in lots of ways. But it's leadership behaviours 
that enable those super facts I talked about, meaning autonomy, so on and so forth, regardless of personality. Personality actually um, is quite limited in the extent to which it predicts leadership success. And what do I mean by that? Well, as psychologists, you know, what we're obviously, what organization psychologists, I should say, because we're aiming to understand how can we predict and therefore develop performance in organizations through leadership or, or whatever factor it is. So when we think about leadership uh, and we think about individual leaders, then of course we understand that everybody has at their core their values, which are things that you know you're brought up with, that you sort of tend to get instilled during your your childhood that you may then go on to accept or reject as as you as you get older and have new experiences. But we all still have values at our core. We express our values through our attitudes towards the world, what we think, how we think things should be and how we think sh things shouldn't be, how we think people should be and how people shouldn't be, which in turn can be understood to a degree in terms of our personality, what our preferences are and, you know, what, our mot what motivates us, what excites us, you know, what turns us off and so on. Whoops, wrong way. Which then goes on to predict to a degree how we might behave you know, in terms of, you know, uh, whether we whether we choose certain situations or shy away from them, whether we um, are, you know, uh, choose certain jobs or whether, you know, it, or ways in which we kind of operate in the home and so on and so forth. Lots of things in which we behave, we can understand from the lens of personality. But then it's behaviour that, of course, is, the, is, is then what results in performance rather than personality immediately linking to performance. And the reason why personality, albeit very useful in many ways, is very limited in terms of predicting performance in role and, and, and effective leadership is because for there to be a strong correlation or a strong link between personality and just the behavior, let alone performance, you'd have to live in a cave because there are so many contextual factors in our worlds, whether it's our personal lives, our family lives or our organizational lives that intervene and what we know actually maybe it's a surprise to you that because I mean personality is a huge industry but actually um, less than 10 percent of job performance is explained by personality when you actually look at the research behind it because what's happening is then is in the case of organizations and leadership workplace factors are intervening between personality and behavior. And what I mean by that is, I mean, so COVID-19 is a fantastic example. The last year has been, um, uh, 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 you know, incredibly illustrative of how global forces, the global context has meant that all of us have to operate differently. Almost all of us have to operate differently. Our organizational context, you know, the, the, the sort of vision, the strategy from year to year of our organization, the sector context, you know, politics and priorities will have a massive impact on how we have to operate in the workplace. Then, of course, there's technological changes. There's what the role requires from week to week or month to month. Then there's what our colleagues need from us. Then there's what our stakeholders need from us. Then there's what our team members need from time to time. Or what we what or what we what we need to get them to do or ask them to to achieve, then there's the demands of your job that fly in hour by hour or sometimes minute by minute, and so on and so forth. So there are tons of factors, what we call extraneous variables as psychologists, that that mean that we cannot behave in leaders or in organisations, even as you know a frontline employee in ways that we might prefer, and that's why personality is limited in explaining effective leadership, particularly when it comes to increasing meaning, autonomy, mastery, so on and so forth. And what I'd like you to think about is that this is liberating because regardless of whatever your personality type is, according to Myers-Briggs or uh, Lumina or anything, or any of the different tools, being highly effective and being highly engaging and enhancing well-being is absolutely within your control. And that's not to say that every job suits everybody, because as I said, personality is, of course, an important understanding of, of in general, what kind of 
role status and, and and when a role changes too much it doesn't suit us anymore then it's time to move on of course it is but in role as you know no role is going to be perfect and, and so much of being a good leader as I said is about how you behave regardless of what your personality type is and there is no such thing as the pro personality profile of a good leader or a bad leader as much as we'd like to believe especially when we get a profile of the ENTJ and we think, yes, I always knew I was a natural leader. Unfortunately, that doesn't actually work that way. And whilst I'm on the topic, being charismatic or extrovert has nothing to do with effective leadership either. If you read our research or other people's research around leadership, um, you know, you can be absolutely an introvert and a quiet leader and be just as effective as, as someone charismatic and Indeed, I haven't got time to talk about it now, but charisma can be quite misleading when it comes to effective leadership. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a chance to reflect about your leadership. So if we look back at the super factors, I've just put here one statement per super factor to give you a chance to reflect for a few moments on the extent to which you believe that you currently enact these behaviours. So what I'd like to suggest that you do is that you reflect on, on um, give yourself a score out of 10, for example, on to the extent to which you believe that because of your leadership, your team knows how they contribute to the overall vision of the department or the organisation. Autonomy. To what extent do you believe that you have created a climate in which your team members feel trusted to do their job, whatever level you work at? And what extent do you believe that you demonstrate through what you say and you know what you do that you actually expect them to do well too? The next one is about mastery. To what extent do you believe that you support team members to develop new skills? So do you coach and mentor them? And it doesn't necessarily mean formally, like sitting down for an hour and a half, whatever it is, informally or formally, to what extent do you believe out of 10? But this is something that's generally true of you. And, you know, if you take this back to the workplace and reflect on it further, you might want to do this on a, thinking about each individual employee that you have. To what extent do you believe that you, as an employee, team member, if you're uh, someone who runs a large organisation, I don't mean everybody, I mean people that you directly report, that they directly report to you. Appreciation, to what extent do you believe that you genuinely notice what people have done and that you thank them for the work they've done, especially when things have been tough. Psychological safety, to what extent do you believe that the ways that you behave, what you say and do, ensure that there is a safe environment within your team for making people making suggestions and right, admitting, and the other bit is admitting when they don't know. Because you know a, a lot of teams have a climate of people don't dare admit when they don't know something because of the way you will be treated. And often it's bravado by other team members, but anyway, it's critical that you create conditions in which people can admit when they don't know. So what extent do you do that? And then finally, to what extent do you ensure that your team members feel socially supported? That means that they have the opportunity to discharge negative emotions, that they can you know, genuinely share their anxieties and their worries. And, and get support or advice or whatever it is, or just vent with people. And of course, also celebrate success in terms of you and in terms of their peers. So what extent would you rate yourself out of 10? Now, what you might want to do now is um, take a picture of this screen. So I'm going to move on to the next screen and just suggest some particular reflection or if you, I don't know if you've written down those words, meaning, autonomy, mastery, and so on, and put your, your, your number next to it. But what I'm gonna suggest that we do now is that I'm gonna suggest, suggest some particular things to reflect upon. Okay, so let's start with the things that you believe are, are strengths in that list. Which of the things on that list do you believe you do really well? Now, assuming that you are happy with 8.5 8 is really well, or perhaps you think 8 is really well, or 7 is really well, which things do you believe you do really well is the first question. The second one, of course, is how do you know? So what is it that you do that you think um, 
demonstrates that you do one of those things really, really well. And critically, of course, who could you check this with? Because as human beings, you know, the whole reason why things like 360 exist is because we tend to have poor self-awareness, both in terms of what our blind spots are in a negative sense, but we can also have massive blind spots that are positive, that we do things much better than we realise. So who could you check this with? And then you might want to think about uh, which do you feel that you need to develop? Which do, which have you rated yourself lowest on, if any? <laughs> In those areas, what do you feel that you could do differently? And and then who could provide you with feedback or suggestions? Because again, you know, leadership development needs to be a team sport. It's not something that we can sit and introspectively reflect on what we can do better. You know, we need to be inviting suggestions and ideas and, and comments and so on. So I'm going to uh, pause the slideshow just for a moment and we'll sort of take some thoughts about this exercise and also if you've got any questions so far. Whoops. Now, how, where are we going with this? So... Just one, aren't any questions yet? Just one comment, apparently. Are there any, okay, so 90% feeling more productive really surprises me. No, fair enough, fair enough. I mean, you know, we're talking about a sample of 1,200 people. So it's not necessarily reflective of all different organizations. Um, but um, certainly, it, what it seems to be the case is that a large proportion of people feel that their work lives and they would be more effective in general if they had the opportunity to work the way that they want to. So I'll just uh, pause for another minute, see if there's any other questions or comments. Someone, uh, someone said, I think it's hard to know uh, genuinely by asking team how effective you are as a leader as they may just be being nice. Can you please put the previous slide up again? Um, yes, Jen, I'll do that in a second. Um, unfortunately, I can't see the slide and the screens at the same time. Um, and someone, uh, and Catherine said, good to share this in Teams. Okay, so what I'll do then is I'll go back to the previous slide again. And I'll show that so that in case anybody wants to take a photograph of that, I assume that's the slide that was being referred to just now. So I'll just um, I'll just check out with any more comments or questions, and then I'll I'll sort of just share a couple more thoughts. Well, a few more thoughts before I end this session. So let's. let's stop sharing. Going back here. Okay, so Kate said you said charisma could be a bit misleading in a leader. Do you often find people trade on their charisma to get to the top? Yes, 100%. Um, I think that some people who are highly charismatic and use it to trade, they are, you know, perhaps aware that they have, um, let's say, weaknesses in relation to what their, the job they're going for, but they sort of feel they'll style it out. A lot of people, some people sometimes say that the current government might be full of people who've styled things out. Um, you know, there was a I, there was a great phrase, I don't know if anybody follows uh, John Crace, talked about people who fail upwards, you know, who don't, um, who have fantastic connections, they're incredibly well, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean political connect, correction, collection, connection, sorry, but just political with a small p in organizations or industries 
where nothing they seem to do badly has too much of a reflection on their ability to continue with um, continue progressing in an organization. Um, so, you know, and, and of course, we know that a lot of political um, allegiances and, and, you know, success comes down to, you know, seducing people with your personality effectively, which is what charisma is about. It's about being, being magnetic. It's about people wanting to be in your orbit. Um, I would recommend you might read something like Snakes in Suits if you want to hear more about the other side of it, of course, which is a side where um, people who might be um, kind of sociopath sociopathic and lacking in the, the morals that we need in organizations to be sustainable and to do the right thing for both the customers and the community um, can, can progress really, really well in organizations until they finally um, either sort of crash the car, i.e. the organization, or, you know, People talked about, for example, um, Fred the Shred et al. at RBS being uh, talking about talking as if they were masters of the universe. You know, so there are people who are kind of, you know, highly, um, you know, who have been highly successful in their careers but weren't necessarily competent at, at leading in the system. And, and look what happened. So, uh, so I would say that we need to make sure that we are really clear that when someone is charismatic because if you're charismatic and you're you have a strong moral compass and you are highly effective then the world is your oyster but what we need to be really careful about is that even as psychologists we can get very seduced by people who are highly charismatic in a selection scenario when it comes to just any kind of role in an organization but also leadership and we need to be asking ourselves are we really being objective because we can run the most incredibly well-designed assessment centre um, and then comes to the wash-up session and, you know, someone who's highly charismatic, we might say, well, and I've seen this happen in real life, it's really scary. Um, you know, I know that, you know, Jim was, um, you know, was, was he was, he didn't do brilliantly on the numerical reasoning and he was a bit, you know, forceful in the team tasks, but there's something about him, you know, and I'm sure many of you will recognise that. So sorry, I'll stop I'll talk about charisma. Um, so since, since leadership is so, how people who are not naturally like the comfort of the head leadership qualities, well, I would say about getting feedback, get, seek feedback. You know, the only way we can know we're any good is if we get feedback because, you know, we have, we have an audience, we have stakeholders, whether we like it or not. So the best way to do would be to do something like a 360 or, and that's formally or informally, get feedback from people. And when they tell you that you're great, and you know, and, and in a situation where they feel safe giving you honest feedback, that's the other thing. 360 must always be for development purposes only, and it must be, um, you must provide the opportunity for people to be confidential if you want them to be really open with you. Um, if that suggests that you're brilliant, then you you then you are. So do I think do we think COVID-19 will inspire new types of leaders and encourage staff to develop to demand different leadership styles? Uh, I hope so, Simon. I really hope so. I think, as I was saying in an earlier slide, it's really shone a light and really highlighted the, the cracks and the fissures in leadership in organisations. I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but we've had loads of requests for top teamwork, particularly in local government recently. I think people are recognising that, uh, you know, it's, it's not a whole new skill set that leaders need. As I said, it's it's stuff we always needed, but we've just allowed, we've neglected, and we've not we've not insisted upon. So I hope that what happens is that organisations start to completely rethink what do we mean by leadership? How are we measuring leadership? Are we looking at behaviours or just competencies? Because if we don't look at behaviours, we're not going to get those super things. We only look at sort of professional competencies and so on. We're not going to engage people and help keep them well and reduce their burnout and so on and so forth. So I really, really hope so. And in five years' time, I think I hope leadership will have will have, you know, in the same way that virtual working has become a is not is no longer a nice to have, it's a necessity. I hope that good leadership will also be a necessity in five years' time. So uh, yes, yeah, so someone said, Can you repeat the book title? Is it Snakes in Suits? Yes, it was. Um, there's another one called by Jean Lippmann Bloom and called The Allure of Toxic Leaders. 
and she talks about and i'm sure most of us have experience of this people who trample over other people to get where they want to be in their in their in their careers and they have a trail of body parts she talks about it in their career paths so i would suggest uh, so Jen Brava, highly charismatic with poor performance, very hard to challenge. Uh, well, yes, if the wrong performance metrics are in place or if you don't have the right performance metrics. So the other big issue that, of course, organisations have is they don't have sufficiently robust performance management systems. And that's even they didn't even have this before the pandemic. So another thing that I hope will become highlighted and will become significantly strengthened is how we performance manage and the extent to which we do it well. And I would love to believe that fads like, not fads, that, that well, some things are fads, definitely. I would love to, I mean, constant feedback is really critical. It, it absolutely is critical to, to creating successful teams and maximizing performance. But, but informal feedback in place of formal feedback as well is not going to work. We have to keep people even more than ever, you know, understanding and aligned with the vision of our organization. So I really hope that that comes up, but we've got to be asking the right questions. It's going to be about how people behave towards each other in empowering and enabling and supportive ways rather than just are they getting the job done, are they hitting the targets. Um, do How much do you think the pandemic will accelerate diversity, representation and leadership roles? I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, that's a great question. I mean, so a lot of the work we've done over the years has been looking at what are the barriers to career progression for people, either women or black, Asian or minority ethnic leaders in terms of progressing their leadership um, careers. And, you know, I, I, well, I, I hope that things like the Black Lives Matters focus has got people to really think. And of course, the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on on minority ethnic communities or black communities or Asian communities. And um, the um, I think, unfor unfortunately, in terms of gender, I think what the what the stats suggest they've gone backwards in terms of gender representation and, and, and women's equality in terms of, uh, you know, home life and childcare during the pandemic, that, that needs to be addressed again. But, but basically, um, I hope that this new conversation about things like um, diversity, inclusion, about white fragility and stuff opens up conversations that we absolutely need to have and, and in time leads to better representation. So uh, I hope that's of some use to respond to your question. There's so many questions. I could do five more presentations. <laughs> right. So I'm going to move on to my, my last couple of few thoughts. Thanks, Julia, for that comment. That's really useful. Okay, so so here we were. The next thing that I wanted to suggest, sorry, we've talked about reflecting on your leadership, is that you be aware of the drains. So I was gonna show a picture of a plug hole and a sink for this, but look at that gorgeous drain. That's a reservoir, I believe. Um, we need to focus on positive emotion in teams, and this links to psychological safety as well. And that means as a leader, we have a responsibility to ensure that we don't allow people to sabotage our team, to sabotage our success and the culture that we build. So what we need to do is we need to, as leaders, really step up to the plate the rail drains in human form and banish inappropriate negativity because this has such a negative negative effect on on team performance on things like psychological safety and and so on and so forth and, and please notice the use of the word inappropriate because constructive criticism is critical if we don't have the opportunity to say how things could be better or to believe that we need to do different things differently then there's no motivation to change so it's about inappropriate negativity and that means body language as well as what people say so there's a great book called um uh oh god what's it called incivility it's about incivility it's like uh, porath and pearson and it talks about um incivilities in the workplace 
you know, it it can really, you know, um, make people feel inhibited and, you know, uncomfortable just by people, you know, they to start talking, people rolling their eyes. Oh, God, you know, they might even not even not even say anything out loud. They might be looking out the window, they might be looking at their phone when people are talking, as well as making negative suggestions like, you know, you're right, or oh, that's never going to work, or all those kinds of things. So it's really important that you keep an eye on this in your team, because what we know from research is that high-performing teams use at least three to one positive to critical statements towards each other. As I said, it's important to create a, an environment where people feel safe, saying when they don't think something's going to work, but they've got to be open to the idea first and not to use inappropriate negativity that shuts down conversation, that inhibits people, and so on and so forth. So what can be interesting can we do can can we sort of count that in your next team meeting how often do people um say something positive or neutral neutral is absolutely fine but then how much does negativity creep in and, and what is the ratio and and as leaders we absolutely must role model what's acceptable and what's not so if we see negative things and we let it slide then people will think it's okay and they won't feel safe we need to challenge this we really do Final thoughts are, here's some suggestions for you. Be humble and ask for support. Everyone's learning at the moment how to lead differently, everybody. So this is a great opportunity to say, I just don't know what to do. Can I get some support? Ask HR, ask OD, whatever, your line manager, whatever. This is a great opportunity to, to, to be vulnerable. Invite your team members. If you don't know what will work with your team, ask them. Building a shared vision of success in small or large ways is critical. We must invite people's suggestions and they'll be much more committed to what comes out. Find out what people need and then take a leap of faith and trust them. You will always get what you expect. If you don't trust people, as we talked about earlier on, you will find that it reinforces itself and you'll find that you have no reason to trust them because quite frankly, they didn't act that way that you thought they would. And that's because of your behavior often, but it might be lack of competence or confidence, in which case support that first and then take a leap of faith. And similarly, if you expect people to achieve, they will. Increase self, I'm, I'm not going to talk about obviously mental health in great detail, but just remember that all the things I've talked about today are things that are within a leader's hands and within their power to either significantly increase well-being or can have a significant um, negative effect on well-being. But one of the key things for leaders is to talk about mental health in the same way you do we talk about health, physical health. Don't talk about okay versus not okay. Talk about it as a continuum. And rather than talking about one in four people experiences a mental health episode, we need to start talking about four in four. Because all of us, in the same way as physical health, whether or not we've ever had a significant episode, we all fluctuate in terms of how well or unwell we feel psychologically. So it's four in four, it's not one in four. And we need to be more comfortable having those conversations. Provide team members with support and encourage peer support and bonding time and positivity. And if you have chance, sorry, I did rush off from that slide, but this video will be available afterwards. You can fast forward, so I guess, to the slides that you're interested in if, if it's of use. With support for HR and OD, we need to be thinking, are the policies that we have in place, are they, are they going to work in terms of making remote working easier and not more stressful? Lots of different ways. Again, build shared vision, ask, ask people what they need, what's not working. Provide meaningful support for leaders to rethink performance appraisal in terms of results focus rather than ongoing, you know, stricter, stricter targets that aren't working, that aren't allowing flexibility and a greater feedback culture. Oops, those two have come at the same time. Support education around mental health problems versus so talking about emotional well-being rather than mental health problems, but not but not to sort of, you know. Um, to, to whitewash when people do have major mental health challenges. Of course, that would not be helpful at all. Um, explore consistency around expectations of uniformity. So if you have like a, a one whatever culture or, a, you know, make sure that that isn't stifling the differences that teams need to be able to um, consider or to be able to implement for them to work, for remote working to work for them. And then finally, um, help teams to develop both internally and in connection with other teams and across boundaries. Sorry I've had to rush. If you want any articles that explain what I've been talking about in more detail, then, then please feel free to get in touch or, or look at our website. Uh, and I believe I'm handing back now to Catherine. 
thank you. Juliet, that was a phenomenal um, presentation. Um, oh, and I think we've had a lot of talking today and I think for a lot of us here, it's probably kept us really, really hooked. I've written some personal um, reflections down for me and my team. I, I really liked the be aware of the drains as well as that exercise and something personal for me around, um, I haven't done a 360 for a while. I feel like I'm still working on my other stuff, but I'm thinking, oh, is that me about, is that is that something that's quite scary for me? And that, that just alone has just been really, really helpful for, for, for me personally. So, so thank you. There's absolutely lots to take away and I'm sure um, that people will go back to your presentation. So that was absolutely brilliant and thank you so much. And we've had quite a lot of um, chat around that in the in the questions and answers. So um, um, there was just one question. Um, there was a book you mentioned about snakes in suits. Do you know who that is? Who that is by? And we can we can put that out there as well. So probably people will be writing. I writing all think, links. I'm gonna I'm gonna just, Google it right now. I think it's by Adrian Fernham. Um, he's uh, he's one of the uh, psychologists that talks about the, the issues around um, psychopathy. In, uh, in leadership, which is a whole other area. And oh, no, sorry, it's not Adrian. It's um, Paul Babiak and Robert Hare. So if you Google snakes in suits like I just did, it's the, the subtitle is When Psychopaths Go to Work. I mean, this is, this is more of the extreme example. If you read Jean Lippmann Blumen, The Allure of Toxic Leaders, so that's Blumen, she talks more about the day-to-day, -day, the ways in which our leaders take credit for their team's work and you know, how people use other people to move um, forward in the organization in a in a destructive way. So, I mean, th th there's lots of resources around there. Um, and yeah, so I hope that I hope those are helpful. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. I feel like you were just talking to me. And, but yeah, I know there's like probably about 100 people on the call. So thank you very much. These uh, videos will be available later. Um, I've just been reminded as your chair for the day, um, can pe people can join the workshops via the links that have been sent to them or you can click on the buttons underneath the screen on this conference page I think yesterday when I logged in it took me about half an hour to realize there was other stuff underneath the visual so please feel free to scroll down and I, and I would recommend um, joining some of the workshops this afternoon and this is where some of those um, conversations that have maybe sort of sprouted in your head from this morning you can sort of explore some of those so I would really really recommend this is your time as well um, away from some of the day job to um, share best practice and um, some of those mindful employer skills right so um, that's it for me um, we've got lunch of 45 minutes and then there's back into workshops I'll just remind you again what those workshops are managing conflict for well-being when home isn't a safe place taking an organizational approach to domestic abuse and violence being an authentic leader, then we have another break for 15 minutes and then later on an introduction to creative team building. So that's really where we get a bit arty and um, it, those barriers come down a little bit. Getting started with a wellbeing strategy. Again, I'd really recommend you all look at those 10 steps to wellbeing. There's lots of case studies and real life stories in there. And that's led by our brilliant Laura McCulloch, our coordinator, who's pulled this, this, this event together. And mindfulness for leaders and managers leads mindful mind, mindfulness cooperative that's laura i just like to thank all the panel members everybody who's involved everybody who sent their questions in um, it's been a brilliant morning um go and eat and recharge yourselves and um, we'll see you for the workshops this afternoon thank you i've really enjoyed hosting today